Hello, welcome everyone. It's such a so gratifying to see so many people show up on time and even just a little bit late to hear one of our best speakers on a topic that's really important, particularly in these parlous and troubling times as we're all home forced to Zoom. So I just wanted to let you know that I am thrilled to announce that Wendy Wagner-Smith is speaking today. She's a career communications professional and expert in plain language and usable design. She's currently a senior writer editor for the Small Business Administration. And Wendy has taught plain language to federal employees in more than 55 agencies and offices of the national federal government, as well as employees of state and local governments across the country. And I know her best from her work 2012 to 2018. Wendy coordinated the training for the Federal Plain Language Action and Information Network and managed a core of volunteer instructors coordinating all the plain language training requests from across the government. So I know that she's been doing a lot of this training herself. I'm eager to hear what she has to say. And I'm sure we all look forward to your questions in the chat later on. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you, Catherine. Man, you made me sound so awesome. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're spending your afternoon this way. It tells me that there are things that you really feel you need to learn, and I'm so excited to get to teach you that. But let me make sure that I point one thing out before we do anything else at all today. Today, I am not teaching you how to work Zoom. WebEx, MS Teams. I am not teaching you how to do those technical things. I'm going to teach you instead how to take what you already do, which is teach plain language or make presentations about this, that, and the other, hopefully including plain language, and change that from what you would normally do live in a classroom with a group of adult students in an agency to this forum here. Uh, where we are communicating through streaming media on a screen. So let's see, why is, there we go. My button's a little sticky today. So there are a number of takeaways we're going to look for today. And there are a couple of things I wanna make sure that you take with you before the end of the day. The first thing is, Remembering that this uh, interface where we are communicating through screens is very different than being in the room with someone. And what you're gonna do as the person delivering the instruction is gonna be ever so slightly different. But ultimately it's like historians say about people from olden times versus people of today. I think by the end of our class, you're gonna see that uh, teaching online has much more in common than teaching with teaching in person than not. Uh, so don't be afraid. This is going to be fun. And we're going to take this little trip together. So the first important thing for you to understand, as of right now, I am doing everything wrong. I'm shifting around. I'm moving. I'm lifting my chin and eyes. And I can't do that anymore the way I would in a classroom because right now I am TV. Congratulations, when you move to this format, you become your very own self, a television anchor. And it's very important to realize that television anchors are trained for a long time and have a lot of practice to be really good at what they do. So we're just gonna try and do the same thing maybe with a little less practice, but starting from now, we're gonna to work towards expertise. So we'll start out with how TV anchors do things. And I'd like you to take a look at this young lady here for just a moment. Notice the position of her eyes, chin, mouth, and hands. Those are all very important factors when you're teaching through a streaming interface. So the first thing is smile and never ever stop. We must be on guard for rough, resting, ugly face. 
every single moment that we are live on stream when we are presenting or teaching. Now, I'm going to show you something that very few people besides my family have ever seen. And I think it's going to be a very dramatic kind of demo for you. In just less than half a second, I am going to transform completely from myself to my grandmother. Watch. That's resting ugly face. I let all of the muscles in my entire face and head relax and gravity took over and suddenly I was no longer Wendy. I was Helen. So it's important to remember that we need to keep smiling, keep our cheek muscles and jaw muscles engaged and keep our chin parallel to the floor. When you are on screen, especially if you are a person like me with a glass face, meaning that people can see right through me, they know exactly what I'm thinking. You have to adopt a habit of purposely making your face look happy, friendly, accessible, and open. Now, part of that is, that is a trick because it really has to do with the equipment that we have. If I am a television anchor, I have an entire crew just on the other side of the room making everything easy for me, but I'm in my dining room. So what am I gonna do? The first thing I'm gonna do is what the pros do. I'm gonna lift the camera. You can't see this, but my camera, my laptop is actually sitting on a small shelf from a high school locker. It's the perfect height. And it makes it so that I have to lift my eyes ever so slightly to look into the camera. And that gives you the impression that I'm looking directly at you. If I look straight into the screen, now you can see that I'm looking slightly down. So it's a little trick of positioning. The other thing, and this time I am gonna adjust the camera because it's important, best posture. Spine is straight, shoulders are back and down, chin is parallel to the floor, and most importantly, relax, relax. You can always tell on screen when someone's nervous or frightened because they will instantly appear to stiffen, and I can do that for you. We can go from this to instantly. And when I stiffen, the corners of my mouth will automatically turn down and I'll become my grandmother again. So I wanna uh, guard against that by practicing in every single meeting. And if you're like me, you'll have a lot of those. Practice on screen, smiling, keeping your chin up and looking up into the camera. Now, the one thing you'll notice I am a gesturer, I tend to talk with my hands, but when you're sitting stationary, that's not really good. Part of the advantage of lifting your camera is that if you need to move your hands, you can sort of do it under the camera level. And yet I still forget, I know you've already seen me lift my fingers a few times into your view. So I have to be aware of that and constantly practice. The one thing we don't want to do, unless it's the end and we are saying a cheerful goodbye, is get into any hand waving, measuring, gesturing, pointing on the screen. The cameras used in laptops are notoriously bad for something called fish eyeing. That makes a concave image into a convex image and distorts the way you look and it will also distort the way your hands look. And if someone has a poor connection, it can cause them a lot of confusion about what's happening on the screen. So keep your hands, shoulders quiet, let your head do the moving, let your chin stay up, and remember, smile, smile, smile. Come on, what's happening now? I hate it, I hate it, there we go. Now again, this assumes that you're sitting still if you go out and look at all the amazing information that is available on the internet, you will see there is a big movement right now, probably because of what we call Zoom fatigue and or screen meeting fatigue. 
for people to begin standing while they present. It's not as easy as it sounds. In one of my other lives, I teach yoga online once a week. And so I'm standing and bending and lying down and everything else while the image is streaming from the laptop. Um, so there are different techniques that you would use in the same way that maybe professors in a classroom would use different techniques if they were being filmed by a camera. We're strictly talking about what we normally do now in our quarantine environment, sitting upright in front of a laptop and delivering information or a message. Also the pros, classy, not flashy. How you dress and how you present actually does matter in the same, day, same way that it would matter when you were in a live classroom. You want to be comfortable. You're going to be sitting, as we are all sitting right now, for an hour or more. In the same way that I would train the plane trainers, remember, you're going to be on your feet standing in front of the class for four hours. Be ready, get your body ready. The same thing happens when you're sitting for a long time. You'll notice that as I've been talking, my voice has become a little less crisp and a little more croaky. So I always have water nearby, but I only take a sip because I'm going to be here for an hour or more. And if we were going to have a break, you, the students, would have the break, but I would be here to take your questions and help you. So I need to make sure that my throat is moist, but I'm not putting myself in an, into any kind of uncomfortable situation. Same thing with clothes and jewelry. Just remember, anything that catches your eye will catch the eyes of your audience a thousand times over. Uh, you'll become very aware of what presenters on television are wearing and all of their accessories now that we're talking about it. But you'll notice that as a general rule, no wacky hairstyles. This is wacky enough for me today because you know, the higher the hair, the closer to God, no jingly earrings, nothing overwhelming, simple and what grandma would call tasteful. And also watch out for patterns pinstripes and plaids that can cause a blurring effect on the screen as you move or as you turn your head. Speak clearly and at a moderate speed. About 120 to 130 words per minute, which is the recommendation for folks who give speeches. I did speech writing for a long time and I had one executive who was a really slow talker, but he got by with it because he was pretty interesting. But if I went at this pace for the rest of our time together, you would all find yourselves in quite a sleepy state within the next few minutes. So keep your speech at a normal pace enunciate each word clearly and pronounce the words correctly. But don't stress if you have a, an accent, if you are not a native speaker of English, or if you come from a region where the way people talk is, uh, let's say, distinguishable, it's okay. Differences make us who we are. And I bet every one of you already has figured out that I'm not from here. Oh no, I'm from way down south. But it's okay if I pronounce the words in a way that all of the people in the audience can clearly understand them. I don't have to be worried that I have an accent. I just need to be worried that I'm speaking the language in a way that's accessible to everyone who's listening. Now, more things about TV anchors. Again, you can only see a small amount of what's happening in the room around me, but just, and here's my hand, just above me and in front of me is a light in the ceiling and I have it set 
for exactly the right of amount of light because we have a dimmer switch, thank goodness. So it's not too bright and it's not too dark. The key here is the light should always be in front of you and not behind. And if you're uh, using overhead lighting, you need to be just behind and underneath the ceiling light. Never allow the lighting to come from a strong side angle or from behind you. What will happen is you'll cre create um, a, an unexpected and unintended uh, and very disorienting silhouetting effect. Again, remember you've got to keep smiling and you've got to look approachable. If suddenly you go into shadow and the corners of your mouth begin to turn down, your audience will immediately sense a change in the mood and become very alarmed about what's happening in the class. And as soon as that happens, they lose concentration. So I started by telling you we're not going to learn the technology today but it is crucial that you learn the technology at some point. When we were getting warmed up, as you guys were coming into the waiting room today, I was telling my team of wizards who were behind the curtain to help keep this a smooth technological experience for us all, that I use MS Teams in my office, I use Zoom for my other stuff, I'm involved with a group that uses web, Cisco WebEx. Each week I have to relearn each of those platforms and remember, oh, this feature is here in this particular software application. So the most important thing is don't get fancy with features when you're teaching unless you know that you know that you are an expert. There's always a workaround but the most important thing is keeping things moving. Now, laptop cameras and home lighting, not a good long-term solution. It's fine for our work meetings and for an event like this or a singular class, you can usually set things up in your home office or home environment so that you have good light and good positioning. But if you do this often, and I encourage you all to do this often, it's incredibly important. It's really worth the investment of about $50 for a tabletop light stand, a ring light, or an LED stand light, and a better camera. You can also use old iPads or iPhones that have kind of outlived their usefulness to be dummy streaming advice, uh, devices uh, because these days the cameras on the iPhones are really quite incredibly high quality. And if you're using free software offered on the internet for your streaming, considering paying for account, you'll quickly find that you eat up the time that's allowed in the free versions of the apps like Zoom or that you actually do need the features that are only offered for paid accounts. So judge based on how often you'll use it. If you only do this every now and again, then you're probably fine with just the regular uh, free offering on the internet. But if it's something you do often, consider upgrading a little bit. It will do more for your credibility and help your students learn better than anything else. So oh, timing, here's an important thing, timing and pacing. When I'm in a live classroom, all sorts of things can happen that can't happen right here as I sit in my dining room. For example, I can move around. I can go from student to student and see how they're doing. I can walk up to the screen and point to important concepts that I want to emphasize. There are all sorts of things that I can do. I can go slow because the class is having a hard time or we've had a long conversation or I can go fast, but that's very different here in the screen world. In the screen world, think about television. Two seconds of dead air is immediately noticeable. 
And any lull is going to cause people's attention to begin to wander. And one moment of lost attention essentially means an 80% higher chance that you will end up with a lost student. So always start on time, but similar to what we did today, give folks a few minutes to actually get logged in and deal with their own technology difficulties before you start to deliver your content and teach. Usually about three to four minutes is fine. Five, maybe at the max, I wouldn't go much over five and I would never ever, as we see on the clock here, start as much as 10 minutes past time. By that time, you will have lost more than half of the folks who originally logged in. We're all incredibly busy. I would say many of us are way busier now in our telework worlds than we were in our offices. And things are timed much more precisely because you have to log out of one meeting and right into the next thing. So be aware that timing is way, way more serious an issue now than when maybe you have a group of folks who are in your classroom and feeling that they are having a, an experience that involves getting out of work for a few hours to go do some training. Now, training is just part of the flow of the regular workday. Keep your pace a little brisk. It's better to go too fast than to go too slow. Remember, slow speakers need to practice getting their the rate of speech up to one that would be considered listenable. That does vary, of course, among people. But again, 120 to 130 words per minute is roughly the guideline that TV news anchors follow. Now, this is a very important point. There are a lot of things out there that we are, we are teaching these days that are the result of new research in the past 10 years, in the past decade. And one of them is uh, that we now know, thanks to the internet, the internet changed everything, Human's ability to focus intently has dramatically decreased by orders of magnitude since the 19th century. That's directly co uh, correlated with the rise of radio and later television and later other visual media such as the one we're using. Now we're down to roughly research says 20 to 22 minutes of ability to intensely focus. Now keep in mind, research is done by people who have an interest in whatever's being researched. I think you'll find the reality is it's roughly half this. People can really only focus intently for maybe 10, 12 minutes. 20 to 22 minutes is a stretch. So that means as you're pacing your class, you want to avoid oddly timed sections. Try to keep each section or each new unit that you're teaching limited to roughly 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something on the zeros or the fives of the clock. And try to make sure that you're not letting your uh, sections start on odd number minutes because that will also throw off the timing uh, and the count as you pace yourself. The golden rule, number one thing you need to take with you today, if you don't remember anything else today, please remember this, people have 50 minute bladders. If you're teaching a long class and our plain language classes really are long, they're half a day, you want to stop teaching at the 50 minute mark and give your class a minimum of five minute breaks. 10 is better, but that doesn't mean you get a break. As I mentioned earlier, you will be stationary. You are here to serve your students and you want to keep the lines of communication open so that anyone who has questions or is confused can 
talk to you privately during that break time. You always think there won't be, but there will be folks who need to get your attention in that brief five or 10 minute period. People have 50 minute bladders. Once again, let's recall that our time today doesn't count because we have just an hour for this session. But if the session were going to be any longer, I would be stopping at the 45 or 50 minute mark, even if the rest of our time were only going to be 15 or 20 minutes. So as we always do, and I never manage, but I always try, I'm gonna plan, plan, plan to end just a little bit early. But if I run late, I'm gonna appeal to your better nature and your need for the last little bit of the information and beg you to stay for just an extra two or three moments. But remember, people have to log out or they have to jump into the next meeting for something else very quickly. And they may not have the extra flexibility that they would normally have if they were in the classroom with you. So since we are doing okay, let's talk a little bit about virtual te teaching techniques. If I'm in the classroom and most federal buildings and other office buildings don't look like this classroom, of course, but they look similar. They may, instead of having desks, they may have a conference table or something like that or some other sort of seating for the students. But there will also be a screen, a whiteboard, perhaps a flipboard in the front for me as the instructor to use. And there's almost always a clock. So the classroom difference here is that now uh, I am not freely in and among all of you as you sit in your rows waiting for me to enlighten you with my wisdom. Now I am aware that as you all have today, you can simply decline not to actively participate and you don't even have to do anything except a click. And that makes it a little challenging as the instructor so we encourage liberal use of the chat feature. I know you've all heard the same or something similar to what our folks told you at the beginning. Put your questions in the chat, add your comments, we'll be getting to them. But if you are the instructor and for some reason you're on your own, keep the chat open and set it to open to the public or open to everyone open to all, whatever the feature is in the particular uh, type of uh, software that you're using, whichever one of these platforms you're using. But there's always the possibility, and it happens, it, it, it's happened to me many times just in the past nine months. Every now and again, Sometimes on a Wednesday, like today, midweek, everyone is tired and knowing that they still have a lot to do before the weekend. And they will log in to your class or your session and be completely unresponsive. Each person thinks, it's just me, I'm just going to bow out today and listen. But then suddenly you have 50 people who are just bowing out and listening. So... If the chat is open um, to everyone, we don't have any private conversations happening among students and that's good, no sidebars. But if no one's responding, now I have to begin to play the role of the wizard behind the curtain and create an illusion that the students are engaged and participating. Now, hopefully this will never happen, but if it ever does, and you've run into a, a class or a presentation where everyone's just tired, everyone's off camera, uh, everybody's muted, you have no idea if anyone is actually listening to you or not, then set your chat to private with me only so that everyone thinks they're only communicating with you. And the reason you want to do that is because you as the instructor will then begin answering the questions as though 
you got an answer in the chat. You want to start generating a little bit of energy, a little bit of buzz, and give students who, for whatever reason, feel that they just can't bear it today, that it's okay to go ahead and join in, to type into the chat or to unmute and answer a question. I always like to acknowledge to everyone in my class that I understand that people prefer to stay off camera. This is a new thing for me anyway. Uh, I just began doing this kind of teaching on a regular basis early last summer, like the rest of the world. In fact, here's one of my dirty secrets. Not only can I turn into my grandmother instantly, but I can also turn into an 18th century farm girl within the blink of an eye. Uh, in the early 2000s, and the early mid 2000s in the 2010s, shortly after the Plain Writing Act passed and all of the uh, desire for plain language classes suddenly went to, from zero to everybody in the federal government, um, there was a lot of debate and questioning about whether or not plain would offer virtual teaching. We had maybe two or three years of debating it. We worked with different agencies. Some agencies insisted. Ultimately, we decided we would leave it up to the individual instructors about whether or not they felt comfortable doing virtual training on video. I was one of the Luddites, it's really true. I didn't wanna do it because each time I tried it, I found that I couldn't interact with my students and for me, that's a large part of my teaching technique. So for me to suddenly find in 2020 that I am teaching all of the time virtually meant that I had to begin rethinking how virtual learning happens. A lot of you who've worked with me or been in other classes with me know that it doesn't take much at all for me to get off on a long speech about all of the research I do into how we learn and the neurology of taking in messaging, what happens in our brains when we're listening, when we're looking, when we're hearing, or when we're otherwise sensing a message that's being delivered to us. So for me, it was very important in the beginning to uh, acknowledge my own neurological need and all of the information that was available way back in the olden times of last summer said, tell everyone to turn on their cameras. And I was even teaching other teachers, let your class know that you need to see faces. You can't just teach to a black screen or dead air. You need to see people. You need human interaction try to convince them to keep their cameras on. And I developed a really, really heartfelt message that I was giving before each presentation. And yet, maybe 20% of all the people who were listening to me would actually keep their cameras on. At first I was frustrated by it, and then later I became curious. What is happening that's making this so hard for people? Is it because we're all in our PJs? Is it because we're all secretly introverts and we just never admitted it before? It turns out those are big factors, but there are other things as well that happen when we are in our safe space of our home or our home office and we have to expose our faces. So notice next time your doorbell rings when you weren't expecting anybody, how comfortable you feel opening the door without peeking out first. It's a thing that happens in human brains and we need to be very careful to let people know that we understand that they may want to be off camera. So here's my new recommendation. I've been using this the last couple of months and I'm finding it's much more effective. I tell people, I would really like it if you would stay on camera, but it's fine if you prefer not to. At different points in our time together, 
I may ask you to go on camera and it would be really great if you felt comfortable enough at that point to turn your camera on. The other thing I want you to be very, very aware of is all of the streaming interfaces have options so that a person can keep their microphone muted, but still speak. In Zoom, you just press the space bar. You'll see people leaning forward. Most of the time, it's because they press the space bar to ask their question or speak. So teach that feature to folks when you're getting them all settled in for the class. So we always start out with mics off for all participants. We teach the space bar feature. Now, if everyone is hidden behind a curtain with only their name showing, it's just a screen after all, and you have no idea whether or not they're engaged, and if you have any concern at all about the magnetism and dynamism of your material, you must get your students engaged immediately. Now, that's not a new concept. That's exactly what you have to do in the classroom. As soon as the last person sits in the chair and, and the introducer, who is probably the point of contact from the agency, introduces you, you have got to come out of the gate and immediately get your folks interested. But how do you do that on screen? Here are techniques that I've been using that seem to be really effective. And as I research and learn more, I understand why. Try immediately opening your class with a question, some mystery or problem, or even better, some outrageous, unbelievable example of something that is relevant to what you'll be teaching. Now, you can also start out with something funny, but you must be humorous with care. Uh, I'll bet every one of us can remember some story about someone who told a, what they thought was an innocent joke. Remember, for the person who is offended by a particular joke or humorous anecdote, it was not innocent. So be very careful. Things that tend to work in terms of humor without taking the risk of offending or hurting someone really have more to do with how we all identify together. So I'm gonna bet that at least one of you out there listening today, when I showed you how I turn into my grandma, Helen, I'll bet you chuckled. And it's okay that you chuckled, I wanted you to. And I want us to share that experience that we understand that as we move through time and we're not aware of how we look when we're concentrating or not paying attention and actively engaging our faces, that we may just remind ourselves or others of family members of previous generations. Totally a great way to get a laugh Hopefully no one would be offended because it's more, all, it's more about how we all identify than looking for a situation that we can dig the humor out of. Now, once I present my question or my mystery or throw out my outrageous example, I want my students to engage. And I already know from practice and research that many of them are still not going to go on camera. And it would be an absolute sensual disaster for me to unmute everyone's camera, which is, uh, excuse me, everyone's microphone, which is why it's so critical to teach them how to use the space bar feature. Because as soon as I give that example, I'm going to invite them to hit the space bar and join in. You probably are also uh, familiar with the raised hand features and other features in some of the software. Those are great, but I like to leave those specifically for folks who have a question that is of burning importance while I am teaching. Uh, and sometimes uh, I may ask them still to hold on to, till the end, 
but I usually tell my class, if you raise your hand, I'm gonna acknowledge you. Uh, Wendy? Hi, Catherine. I believe Wendy's um, audio and video froze, so we'll allow her a couple of moments to join back in. Okay. Um, this, I have to say, has been, um, this is Gabby from digital.gov here. Myself and Mara um, work on the digital.gov team. I just want to say while we're waiting for uh, Wendy to rejoin that this session has been very helpful from us for, from our point of view, because we've been able to get some really good feedback for, from you all, as far as, um, you know, how are we typically manage these events of allowing a few, a few extra minutes um, for folks to join in. And, um, and that's been really helpful to get to get your, your guys feedback. So I really appreciate that. Um, and to note for, for folks, uh, one of the main reasons why we don't ask folks to um, have their cameras turned on or um, to be able to speak aloud is because our aim at digital.gov is for as many folks as possible to access this event. So we always strive to put these events up on our digital.gov website, these recordings. And if we had everyone on camera, we would have to um, get permission from all of you folks. <laughs> so um, just to kind of go further from, from what uh, Wendy was discussing, um, that's been very helpful. But hopefully Wendy can rejoin us. Um, Catherine, do you have anything for your community at present? While we wait um, I was just going to say, you know, I've, I've just, emailed her, reminded her she's frozen, you know, because sometimes it's difficult to know what's gone on um, and hoping that she's joining us. But if you could put your questions in the chat, you know, just about this in general, that's, that's a big help. So we have, you know, something waiting for her when she returns. And I was also, um, yeah, this is being recorded. It'll be on digital gov. We're developing a tip sheet as well. So you don't have to email that particular question. But um, one of the things that Jerry McGovern has been talking about recently, and Jerry McGovern is the uh, usability expert who started the whole top tasks movement, which is essentially people don't come to your page for fun. <laughs> you know, when they come to do something, make sure you know what it is and make it easy for them. He has started talking about worldwide waste, which is the problem of digital waste, which people don't necessarily think about. Oh, and if Wendy is back, we can Wendy certainly... Back. Hooray! Wendy, um, you should be a co-host again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what happened, but Zoom just completely disappeared and crashed on me. Bad Zoom, bad Zoom. Yes, bad Zoom. I'm glad everyone is still with me though. I'm going to reshare and finish up if that's okay. But I didn't want to interrupt if uh, Catherine needed to finish her thought. No, 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 no. The only thing I was going to reinforce was please put your questions in the chat. We can seize that opportunity. And if you want to finish up, that would be great. <laughs> okay, so we can get to the questions rather. Okay, excellent. Let's do that. Now, can everyone see that? I see you, I don't you see. You still see me, okay, all right. Okay, well, this is a great example of how the technology can thwart you at every possible moment. Let's try one more time to share. Can you see it now? Yes. Wonderful, okay. So we will- You might wanna go to, there you go. 
we'll go ahead and speed on through. Uh, okay, so sticky material, this is really important. You must repeat, repeat, repeat. We know that adult humans need to hear a message either three or seven times, depending on the study that you check into for it to stick. But don't get hung up on, oh, I've only repeated that four times. Think of it this way. When you were a child and you got up on Saturday morning and made your bowl of cereal and turned on the television, what happened? You were bombarded with images and graphics and video and most of all, music, 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 catchy jingles. So most of us, and I am no longer a spring chicken, most of us can remember almost all of the music from the serial commercials of our childhoods because we heard them repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. So we absorbed the message. What you want to do is make your message sticky so that the person still has it in their mind, in their neurology, while they are in the process of absorbing it. Because you would not be able to repeat it 4,000 times, but you would need, it, need to repeat things two or three or four or five times. For example, let's just remember for a moment that we want to always keep smiling and people have, what? 50 minute bladders, that's right. You remembered it, it popped in your head before I even said it. Okay, sticky material. I primed you when we began talking by telling you what you were gonna experience. Sounds like it shouldn't work, but it's incredibly effective. If I tell you, <clears throat> today we're gonna learn the principles of plain language. And when you finish this class, you are going to be fundamentally different and you are gonna notice things that you never noticed before and think of things in a way you never, never thought of them before. That statement right there opens a neural pathway in your brain and makes you more receptive. Also makes you aware of all those things that will stick. And throughout, I'm gonna drop little calls to action and what I call gold nuggets. Gold nuggets are the little extra bits that we teach, like teach your students how to use the space bar to unmute their mic. And then when they let go of the space bar, they're muted again. Those are little gold nuggets of extra information that people aren't expecting. The miniature call to action is like this. Now, when you get back to your office, the first thing I want you to do, and then tell them. And you will be surprised how many students will come to you in later years and say, you know, I still have that sticky note reminding me of the better word choice on, on my computer monitor. And then you'll know you did it. You got through to them and they took something back to their desk that they could use immediately that would change their writing immediately. That's what sticky means. Always use exercises, even in this kind of format. Typed is fine in the chat. In the classroom, we would use the written uh, exercises, but in this format, now I want to push the verbal participation. I want everybody to join in. And I will even sometimes say in my major exercise, I only have one major exercise and two small ones in the shorter class for online. I will even say, now everyone unmute, just yell it out if you know the answer. It causes a little cacophony for a few moments, but it's fun and it does get people uh, involved as well as engaged. Towards the end, the outro of your class is very, very important. Think about how your news anchors end a broadcast. First, I'm gonna let you know that we're nearly done. We just have a couple more things we're gonna talk about before we end today. That's called cueing, letting the person know what's coming. I'm gonna sum up what we've learned, and then I'm gonna repeat those many calls to action. So 
We've learned today that teaching uh, plain language through streaming is a little bit different, but not dramatically different than teaching in a classroom. It's simply a matter of switching in your head your own idea of how you will deliver the message and taking into account the realities of what all your students are experiencing. I'm going to repeat my call to action now. When you leave here, I want you to put that sticky note on your uh, laptop uh, monitor or think this through, or I want you to fire up Zoom and practice opening breakout rooms. One of those things that I've given as a call to action throughout the class, I'm gonna remind you to go and do them before we end up. And then I'm going to open up a forum for your ending questions. Now, always make sure whether you are live in person or are streaming that you give your students a parting gift. We do know from research that adult learners, especially folks who work in white collar occupations, say they feel incomplete if they leave a training session and they have nothing to carry with them. Uh, so that basically equals handouts. People are used to getting notebooks and handouts and books and various things that go along with training. And if they just close the laptop with nothing, it doesn't feel like they were done. So we, I recommend develop, if you don't have one, a checklist tool or something that you can always give to your students. Today, you are gonna receive the Plain Language Action and Information Network editing checklist that goes with our standard plain basic principles of plain language class. It is an outstanding tool. And if Catherine Sosby or Get Beth Gaston are on with us today, let's all give them a hand. It's an incredible tool to use. And I want you to have it as our gift today. They're gonna post it so that you can grab it. And if you are not able to grab it, you can contact me at any time. Do be aware, we have to all be careful about digital files. Don't email cartoons or anything uh, copyrighted. Don't drop licensed items like pictures or intellectual property into the chats. Always try to make sure that either you created the item or you have the rights to distribute it. And then here we go. We're nearly done. Two more things and we're gonna finish up and take your questions. Uh, virtual teachers, like all classroom teachers, need life hacks. Always have your warm water. Always have your mints. Always have your pad for your notes. Always have a pen. And always, no matter what, whether you are online or in person, have a printout of your class. You never know when it's going to save your life or when Zoom is going to completely crash like it did for me. And that, my friends, is the end. Here are some resources. This is on the tip sheet you're going to receive. These are really helpful. There are a billion of them. I would say 999 million are not helpful. These are really helpful online resources for online presenting and teaching. And I will now be quiet and let Catherine and Gabby and Katina tell me the questions and see how I can help you. We still have a couple more minutes before we have to go. Did I lose everyone? Not at all. It just takes us a few moments to find the, the questions. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Again, see, I instantly reacted because there was a second of lull a second of law. Let me just once again repeat, one second is enough for your students to go, what's wrong? So what happened? What happened? Yeah. What happened? What happened? Think about it. Uh, if you're driving and one of those public alert things comes on and there's a second of dead air on the radio, you mm -hmm. instantly are frightened. Same thing happens on television. One question, I seem to have gotten to the questions is how can you 
measure your rate of speed to get into the right range. And someone said, you know, in the chat, you know, you just get a block of text and read it and then count the numbers. I'm sure there's a better idea. And the other part of that question is, what is your opinion of Slido and other technologies for keeping people engaged? Okay, let me uh, answer those in order. Um, so first, how do we measure our rate of speaking? Here's a trick that I taught my executives when I was a speech writer. I would hand them the first page of the speech, which would be typed in double space, roughly about 200 to 250 words on a full eight and a half by 11 page with double spacing. 250 words, read this, don't read the title and I would time them. Your phones now have these great uh, options where you can set a timer and read to yourself, or you can actually talk your class to yourself and time yourself and then just do the division, or you can get an app. Uh, I actually have an app on my phone. Uh, it's not very good, so I'm not gonna tell you the name of it and recommend it. Plus, I don't know the legal implications of that, but uh, if I get worried, and sometimes I do because I tend to go too fast, I can get up into the 150 word a minute range, which basically sounds like a stream of consciousness to everyone listening. So I actually will uh, speak into my memo recorder on my, net, my phone and let my app tell me what my rate was. There are a number of different ways you can do that in practice. Uh, so if one doesn't work, try another. Uh, and if none of them work, send me an email and we'll explore it together. Uh, to answer the question about Slido, honestly, I have not had a, uh, an occasion to use it. I had to rate it for uh, another program that I did. Uh, and I understand how it works, but I have not used it yet. However, I believe that uh, the situation that we have found ourselves in is going to bring incredible innovations. Slido won't be the last, and it may or may not end up being the best. There will be many such apps that come along that help us with engagement and more importantly, measuring our engagement. Because as communicators, we have to always be trying to figure out how we're going to explain the rate of return on what we do for our bosses. So I'm sorry I don't have a great answer for that, but I do know more uh, technologies are coming and then hopefully the next time we meet, I'll have a better answer. Mm -hmm. Do you have just a few moments for questions? Or... Yes, I do. Okay. I do. I'm I'm trying to find out. Oh, there's a somebody. Okay, I'm so sorry. We don't actually have many more questions. Although I did drop something in the chat about um, Jerry McGovern and Worldwide Waste. He's talking about people need to curate and manage their content, and also he talks about what we hadn't been thinking about, which is, you know, how much digital do meetings consume and obviously if you're not using video if you're not using if you're you know not using audio and if you're just using chat you're shrinking your usage but um there's one quick question uh the requirements for backgrounds that you can use oh thank you that's a great question backgrounds okay so <laughs> Uh, recently, I was in a presentation through my job, and uh, the presentation was great, but the person had chosen an unfortunate background uh, that was outer space with lots of weird colors and cosmic stars, and I spent most of the time looking at the backdrop around her head, and I found that it was very hard for me, even though I was deeply engaged in the topic, to understand and keep up because I kept losing my attention focus. So 
my rule of thumb is avoid fancy backgrounds if you're teaching. If you're in a meeting with all your coworkers or if your agency requires you to use a branded background for any meetings that involve external folks, then absolutely do what you need to do in terms of your job. But if you're teaching a large group online, keep it as unobtrusive as possible. Remember classy, not flashy. Uh, this is just my dining room wall behind us, but it's not in any way, hopefully, not in any way detracting from what I'm saying or causing you to lose your focus. Uh, and attention. And remember, focus equals attention. If you focus on me, you are automatically paying attention to me. I just can't control how long you pay attention to me. So I want mm -hmm. you to stay focused. Right. That's an excellent question. I mean, that's an excellent answer. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to have to wrap up. Uh, we are, we will be posting the links and sending the documents to people. Unfortunately, all the questions in the chat about the links, which I couldn't do anything about, drowned out some of the other questions. So we're going to be going through these and we'll send Wendy, uh, Wendy the uh, questions and maybe she can post it back and we can either put that in the community or we can send it back uh, to the participants. But uh, thank you, Wendy. That was Absolutely. splendid. That was just incredible. So much information, so many compliments. It's just, you know, it was an amazing presentation and you have spurred me to action you know, on two things. So, you know, fantastic, fantastic for you. And we greatly appreciate your time and all of the effort you went to with, with the presentation and thinking it through. Uh, Gabby, do we have any last minute, Gabby or Mara, do we have any last minute um, things we need to let the group know? Um, no, all that's to say, um, thanks everyone for joining. And just a, a reminder for folks um, that I put in the chat a couple of times, um, this Zoom for Government is uh, through GSA, our agency. And unfortunately, um, there is a blocker that uh, doesn't allow for most folks and agencies to download the PDF that was provided in the chat window. Um, all that being said, they will be available and we'll be sure to send those to everyone who joined. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you so much, Catherine. Can I add one last thing before everybody clicks off? Absolutely. Please. I make a promise to every class that I teach, no matter the topic, that if you contact me with a question, uh, I will always get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I, we will make sure that you have the correct emails to reach me and feel free to get in touch anytime. Thank you.